All right, we're going to start today in chapter 10 in your book. Chapter 10, page All right, most of you should have basically read this chapter because you had to do chapter 10 questions anyway. This semester, like I told you before, we're going we're gonna to go through two different set of plans. Okay, The first one I'm going to give you, which you can see is probably up here on the screen, it's going to be a very simplistic plan. No, you cannot use Revit to draw this. It will be done in AutoCAD. Okay. Now, where does a set of plans start? Foundation. Has to start with a foundation. Okay. I mean, not a foundation, but a floor plan. Look at it. Okay. Foundation doesn't come until after the floor plan because you got to know what your layout is and all that. So your floor plan really is your most important print in a set of drawings. Okay, it gives you all the layout, wall locations, um, things like that. Some of them even give you the column locations and so forth. The other reason the floor plan is so important is because every other plan builds off of it. Electrical. Okay, you got to know where your living room is going to be set up. You got to, or where your living room is going to be, where vanities are going to be, where your sinks and everything is in your kitchen. So you know your placements of all your electrical outlets, switches, so forth and so forth. So generally when you start a set of prints, okay, and you're, and you're designing a set of floor plans, how are you going to start? Generally you're going to sit down with a client, and they're going to do one of two things, okay? They're either going to hand you something that's already been designed or drawn, Okay, and say, I want something like this, except I want to make a bunch of changes. Okay, that's generally how it happens. Or they're going to sit down and they're just going to give you a rundown, a list of exactly what they want. How many bedrooms? What they want as far as living room, dining room, nook area. What type of kitchen they want? Do they want an open floor plan or a closed floor plan? All this kind of information they're just going to start spitting out to you. Okay? If that's the case, then it's up to you to come up with the design. The example you see up on the screen, this is a little simplistic house. This guy didn't know exactly what he wanted. He just told me, or exactly what he wanted it to look like. He just told me how he wanted it. How many bedrooms, how many baths. He wanted an open floor plan as far as kitchen, living room. Um, he wanted, um, oh, and one of the major things about this house, or even when you go start designing a floor plan, I don't generally start designing a floor plan until I get one thing. Site plan. Yeah, and a budget. Okay. 
The reason you need the site plan is you got to know the restrictions on how big the house can be before you can design one. For example, this house is narrow but long because of the site plan. The lot that he had to build on had restrictions where you could not be within 10 or 20 feet of the property line. Okay? And the lot was very narrow, so I had to build the house to go along with the property. I got to design the house. So there's so many important things you got to uh, know before you can even start designing the house. You got to know what they want, their criteria, and what type, what the site plan is, and budget. Okay? So you have to have a general idea of what the going rate is of building a house also, because not only are you designing this, or, or, or they are paying you for the design, but you got to make sure you keep their design in budget. So if they got a $300,000 budget, you can't design a half a million dollar house. Okay? So that's a few things you need to know. You need to know their budget, their criteria for the house, and you need to know what the property, the site plan looks like. Okay? So that's the three three things that I generally start with. In the book, right there on page 177, tells you you need to ask things like the ages and gender of children. How many people is going to occupy the house? Do they... Another thing you need to keep in mind when you design a house does a house generally stay exactly the same for the life of the house? No. There's going to be some types of renovations, some types of add-ons, all this other kind of stuff. So you want to try to keep that in mind in case there's another bedroom everyone wants to get added. How will it be possible to do this? All this kind of stuff. Okay. I thought about that on this house too. And the thing I came up with was, you notice I have a, a closet right here in the middle as you walk in down the hallway. Well, I put the closet the same width of the hallway in case. If they ever want to add, I knew they could not go this way or this way. They were going to have to go in length. Well, if that's the case, they can take that closet out continue the bedrooms, add bedrooms on the back, and then they can just reconfigure where they put their closets in the bedroom. Okay? That's no big deal. You can always come up with some kind of closet. As a matter of fact, it doesn't have to be a traditional closet. If it came down to it, you can buy one of those big old arm uh, wire entertainment type things where you have a big area where you can... There's so much storage showing stuff that you can buy now, closets and stuff, portable closets, that I knew that, and I talked with the owner about this, like, of course, I got his okay with it, and he loved it, in case they ever did need that, though, okay? So that's kind of stuff you really need to take in consideration when you're designing a house. Another thing, when you're trying to lay out a floor plan, and we'll get to it in a second, you'll see it, a kitchen. A kitchen can really determine a lot of how your house is going to lay out, determine on what a person wants in the kitchen. Okay? What I mean by that, there's, let's say, a person wants double ovens. Okay? Well, guess what? Now, you're going to have to take up extra space in the kitchen for a double oven. I had a client one time wanted one of those big old commercial grade refrigerators. It was five feet long. Okay, that's huge compared to what you're generally putting in its place. So you had to find extra room for that. Um, I can't remember the uh, religion or the type of people it is. But in certain kitchens you can't have you got to have separate prep stations, separate sink, kosher, I think it is, right? It's kosher. Yeah. You can't, like, I think their beliefs are dairy products cannot touch, meat products and, uh, and, and poultry can't touch. It, it's, it's a big old, so you have to know all this when you go to start designing. 
Another big thing is when you design, and I didn't realize this, honestly, because I've never had to do it until I started watching HGTV. Oh, and it just, the name of it just skipped my mind, but it's, um, Feng Shui, okay? Feng Shui, okay, is seriously complicated. If you have somebody who needs a Feng Shui design, you got a lot of research to do, okay? Because, for instance, if it's a two-story house, the master bedroom of the couple cannot be located over the oven, okay? Because they feel that the heat or the fire messes with the marriage. It, mess, it makes them fight. It makes them uh, agitated with each other. Um, in the kitchen, fire and water cannot be with so close to each other. It cannot be on the same wall as each other because fire and water don't mix. All this kind of stuff, uh, when you walk into the entry of the house, there's not supposed to be a staircase, okay? I don't remember the reasoning behind that, but it's like something like it, it represents it represents an uphill battle, or I can't remember. Yeah, so it, it's, yeah, so it can get pretty complicated. Not only that, but you got to worry about too. If you do get those types of situations, you need to have it set up to where you or your company charges more money. Why? Because it it, it does take more research. It does take more research to do it. All right, so these are the things you got to know. The other things you have to know is what you've read in Chapter 10, and that's sizes. Okay? Sizes, when it comes to a floor plan, are the most important criteria you got to go by. Why is it important? Code. Why is code important? Because if you don't follow code, the house doesn't pass inspection. The house will never get a permit to get power turned on, and it will never be livable. Okay? So code is very important when it comes to building a house, and that's what Chapter 10 is all about. We're going to go through it because what they say is minimum is not the way. Let's just say this. Some of the minimum in the book is too small for your average family today to live in. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this book and what I expect you to do in this class is to follow my minimums. <coughs> okay, so if we get into a design or you do a house plan for me, you will be required because there may be a house plan that I give you that I purposely set a minimum of the or set the size of the room under the minimum and I expect you to catch that and fix it. Okay, so this chapter, this is why I told y'all to learn this chapter, learn these sizes, because this is going to be a very, the most important chapter in this whole book. So let's get going through it. All right, the main entry of the house, let's start on page 178 in your book. The main entry in the house, all they basically try to tell you is the size, okay? The size of the entry is all dependent upon the entry door that you have. But the key to the entry door of the main entry is this. It cannot be smaller than 36 inches. Okay? And here's the thing. Entry doors all over the house. And you have to have a minimum you have to have a minimum of two entry doors in the house. Why? Fire code. And let me tell you what governs over everything when it comes to commercial, architectural, industrial. Fire code governs over everything. Okay, if your house does not pass fire inspection, you can, they don't give any, well, I'll let this slide. Fire inspection is the king when it comes to code. And that's what they say is you have to have two minimum, a minimum of two entry doors 
they have to be a minimum of 36 inches. Now, we all know you go around today and look at houses, you don't have a single entry door anymore, do you? You may have it on the front, but generally it's going to have things, it's either going to be a single or double door. If it's a double door, it's going to be around five or six feet wide, just a door. But a lot now, a lot of your main entry doors have the side lights. Okay? It's probably going to have a transom. may have a transom over the top. The transom is just the glass over the top of the door. It's in all different shapes, the rectangle, half moon, all this other kind of stuff. So generally when you're, when you're designing a house, that is also one of the things I do ask. Okay? Your main door, what are we looking at? Because that is going to determine a lot of what your entry takes up. Okay? So you want to definitely um, find out what their door is. Now, your typical header height around the entire house is 6 foot 8 inches. Okay? Why is that important? Because that's the line that when we get down to the um, elevation plan and all that, when you start drawing what the house looks like from the outside, you need to know. Header heights for all windows and doors are usually six to eight inches, six foot eight. Now, if you have a door with a transom on it, it's not going to be six foot eight inches. Why? Because your transom is going to be higher. It's going to depending on the size of it. So that's why it's very important to know what they kind of what they want on the front door. So when you start drawing elevations and stuff, you can show that, hey, they're going to have some type of big transom over this. So the builder, before you start building, you may want to have information on the door so they can build it and put it in place. All right. So generally when you have a main entry, that moves us on to page 179. Generally when you have a main entry, then you're going to have some type of foyer. Okay. It doesn't have to be a big foyer, but let me, let me give you this little bit of advice. You really never want to have to walk straight into a living room from a main entry. Okay. You don't, you don't want that to be, bam, you're in there watching TV, your front door opens and you're automatically in the living room. You want some type of, of, of disconnect, some type of, not necessarily a wall, you don't have to have a wall there, but you just want to have some type of space where you walk through first and then hit into you. So if you just throw up some little false walls or something just to give you some kind of walk in, throw up some columns or something to kind of separate whatever area you're walking into, you want to give some type of little designated area for a foyer. Okay? So a foyer, it can be any size, as big or as small as you want. Okay? You walk through the front door of my house, you literally walk almost like through a hallway. And then you get into all the main rooms. It's just a big lead in to where to the, into the house yeah see and, and a lot of people today are not looking for that they do not want to walk straight into their gathering area yes exactly so today I mean your, your foyer is basically your hellos and your goodbyes okay Unless you like my house and nobody comes through your front door, everybody comes through your back. Yeah, that's just saying. Most houses are like that now. These front doors are just looks. Yeah. <laughs> well, the back of my house has a deck, a pool, a grill, everybody gathers. So. All right, there's another type of entry. Your foyer is generally your main entrance, okay? So keep that separated from what I want to fix and tell you. Your foyer is generally your main entrance. Your second entrance is generally a service entrance. Yeah, it's like coming from a garage door. Or if you have a garage, you're walking through the garage, coming in through the door to the house. Or a lot of people have it coming from, um, even if you don't have a garage, 
or anything like that, you have a car for or something like that, you're walking through a utility area or what they, a lot of people like to consider a mud room. Okay? The reason a lot of people have the mud room, um, and, and, in, and we'll get to it in a second, you'll see this in the book. And a lot of people now in today's, especially down here in the south, okay, it's more country down here, I guess you could say. I do a lot of mud rooms for people because what they do is they put a little shower in there, maybe a little utility sink in there. Because what we do a lot more outdoor stuff down here. And generally because of the rain we get and all that kind of stuff, our outdoor is generally pretty messy. So if you have a little area where you can walk through, take off boots that's all muddy, take off the muddy clothes that you're wearing, all this other kind of stuff. So that's why a lot of people have their second service, or their second entry coming in through a service area. That way they'll have something to clean up. Um, so this is a main thing a lot of people put in their house today. Um, because a lot of the women, when I meet with a man and a woman, a couple, that's the first thing she'll tell me. I need a room where when my husband walks through, he can go in there and wash off before he comes into my house. And, it, and the woman, it is always the woman's house. I'll go ahead and tell you. Okay. It don't matter if you're the only one working. Yeah. It's still her house, so you might as well get used to that. All right, let's talk about a living room. Let's move over to page 180. Okay, the living room, this varies. This is a, this is a huge variation when it comes from house to house. Okay, but... If a house is going to have just a living room, no, no, because what you'll see in a minute, you have living rooms and you have family rooms, okay? A living room, what they kind of classify in the book, is supposed to be more of, um, yeah, it's more of just a sitting area is what a living room is supposed to be. It's supposed to be just a sitting area where people are over, you just go into the living room portion, you just sit, talk, have coffee, have tea, you know, whatever. Exactly. Okay, so that's what a living room, the purpose of it, is supposed to be. Without TVs. A living room is not supposed to have a TV. Okay. So, yeah, all the high dollar furniture where no kids better sit on it with, you know, that kind of stuff. Now, so a living room in, 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 in yesterday's, and I'm doing the quotes here, yesterday's time, the living room didn't need to be that big. 12 foot by 14, um... The book, I think, says 12 by 14, um, 13 by 18 works well. Enough to get a couple of pieces of furniture as far as couches, love seats, coffee table, maybe some end tables. Um, and, you know, the upper class has to have big china cabinets. Uh, I can't remember the name of all the furniture, but the little... Three foot tall buffet. Yeah. Okay, all this kind of stuff in there. Now, so it didn't need to be that big. So 12 to 14, 13, 12 by 14 or 13 by 18, anywhere in that range works well. Now that moves over to the family room. Okay, the family room is what most of us are used to today. That's what we call our living room. Okay, a family room is where. It needs to be big enough where your entire family is in there at one time. You're all watching TV, maybe playing board games, playing whatever video games, all this kind of stuff. So, in a lot of times, this is. I'll go ahead and tell you that the family room generally 
a lot of times is located near the kitchen. Okay? Most of the time you want your family room located near your kitchen. The living room is generally more, where would the living room be more? Dining located. Room. More towards the dining or the entry, the main entry of the house. Because you, a lot of times when you have guests over and you do have a family room, living room, you don't want your guests to make it past the living room. Okay, a lot of times. You want them to stay there. You want them isolated in that one room so there's not a whole lot of cleaning up to do when they leave. Today's time, you don't find many living room family rooms. It's primarily a big old family room. So generally, it is close to the kitchen. Why? Because in today's modern era, most people don't eat in their kitchen anymore. Most people are plopped on the couch in front of the TV eating. So you want to be as close to the kitchen as possible. Okay? That's just how it is today. Now, here's the question I always ask when I go to do a family room. What type of furniture are we looking at? Okay. Why is that important? Because you need to know that you're going to be able to fit all that furniture in this living room or family room. Okay. So, I don't design a family room, and I, I don't remember what the book says. See, the book says uh, a minimum of 13 foot by 16 foot, and that's small. Yeah, small is the minimum for the living room. Yes, that is small, 13 foot by 16 foot. I personally don't go lower than 16 foot by 16 foot, okay? I personally do not go any lower. Why? And people are like, why, why square why square living rooms off? Here's where I square this is why I square living rooms off. If you have a, a spouse like I do, everything has to be symmetrical. Okay. Where your spouse wants to rearrange your house every five weeks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I made I make a lot of things that where no matter what way it's moved, it can fit. Okay? And that's why I like to keep a lot of things pretty square as far as a living room. Now, other rooms I don't necessarily as much, but a living room I do because of the pieces of furniture are a lot more are a lot bigger in a, a family room. So you want to make sure it fits no matter which way they decide to go with it. So that's why I always ask, what do you want in a living room? Or are we talking about a big entertainment center, um, a lot of people like two couches and a little seat. Do you want a big sectional or just one little seat, one couch, one recliner? You need to know this so that you make it big enough. Okay? So I always get this information. Your best friend when you're designing a house will be what? Google. <laughs> okay? Why? Because when people start slinging out stuff you don't have a clue about, the best place to go is Google. Exactly. Stuff, a lot of this stuff's already been done. The furniture sizes are already out there. So if they say, I want a, a, a couch that's a, a, what they call them, couch and a half, which is for people like me who are bigger, okay, who wants that extra room, you need to know sizes because it may not fit compared to a regular couch lossy. So you need to know this kind of stuff. Okay, my living room is I think 18 and a half, 18 and a half feet. Um, and I still honestly could probably lose another or use another couple of feet. All right. Because we do have so many people like on Sundays. Um, yesterday I had eight additional people in my house watching football. Okay, that's every Sunday for me. So I honestly do need a whole another few yeah, feet Sunday to get. Room. Yeah, I need just a straight up football fall room, I guess you'd say. <laughs> okay. Now, the next one, and this is starting to become a dime breed also, is a dining room. 
Okay, this is really becoming a dying breed when it comes to designing houses. And why is that? A lot of people put their tables right there in their family room. That's exactly right. Now, instead of dining rooms, and you'll see that I think one of the next little paragraphs here on page 183 is a nook area. My house personally has a nook. Okay, what's a nook? We'll kind of talk about this page all together. Well, no, a nook is a little piece of area in your kitchen. Okay? So basically, a nook is just an extension of your kitchen. And a lot of times in the nook area, they'll either put a couple of windows right there, or they'll put a bay window. If you don't know what a bay window, we'll get to it in a second. But a nook is right in the kitchen. And so that when you serve your dinner, the family goes and nook. Because a dining room, okay, a dining room now is looked at traditionally as when your Christmas or your holiday gatherings, Thanksgiving, Christmas, things like that, where it's more of a very formal area. Because that's when you take out your, your nice china set, your, your nice four. I don't have that. I use on my china every day, so... You know, we, we don't look at it like that. But So the dining room, yet again, will all be dependent on the size of the table that is going to be placed in this area. That's very important, believe it or not. So you see when you're designing a house, you can't just go in there and let, have them tell you, I want a dining room, I want this, I want this, I want that. you got to get more detail when you're visiting with a client. This is architects. This is even commercial building. This is not just residential. This is even commercial. You have to know what's going to be placed in these spaces. Okay? Dining room. What all generally goes in a dining room? Table, chairs, big china cabinets, buffets, um, um, uh, I can't even think some of the other names of some of the furniture, but yeah, it's, it's a very formal, sophisticated looking area. So, if a person wants a dining room, you have to know the size of the table because they have eight people tables, ten people tables, twelve people tables. They're rectangular, they're circular, they're. So, you have to know, you have to form an area for that. Now, I will tell you this, when you design and you get the table size that they want in it, okay, I don't know if they actually tell you in the book, because they tell you a size as small as 9 foot 11 up to about 11 by 14, but in the book they tell you allow for a minimum of 32 inches from the table edge to any wall or furniture for placement of chairs and a minimal passage area. Of a space of approximately 42 inches will allow room for walking around a chair when it is occupied. That is important. I can't tell you how many houses I walk in that's been designed that does not have enough area to walk around when people are actually sitting at the table. My philosophy is they say 42 inches and you don't have to go by this. This is just my philosophy so you don't have to write this one down. My philosophy is from the edge of the table to the wall or other furniture is five feet. My philosophy, now this is not something that you have to pick up on the rest of the class, but I go edge of table to wall five feet. So if they got a six foot table in the, in the dining room, my philosophy is that room has to be 16 foot that one way. If it's four foot the other way, it has to be 14 foot. Okay, you see where I'm going at. So the room will become a 14 foot by 16 foot. That's the way I design a dining room. All right. That's just for the table. Now, what if they want? A, what do they call? What do they call them? Women, please. Was it cab? The one with the china curio cabinet. Okay, if they want a big curio cabinet in there. You need to add the thickness of the curio cabinet. 
Okay. Then you have to go to open the door. Well, well, five feet, five feet is figuring that in. Five feet would be figuring that in for the simple fact. I want everybody to kind of look at the way you're sitting right now. I want everybody to sit in their chair like you're fixing to eat dinner. Look at the distance you need from the edge of the table, okay, from the edge of the table to the back of your chair right now. What's about the distance you need? 18 inches to 2 feet, no matter your size. It's about 18 to 2 feet. Now think about having a wall between that chair and the wall and somebody is coming behind you after they just got up and went and got more food or something to drink or something like that. What's the best distance to walk? About 3 feet. Think about it like this. You're walking through a 3 foot door. Do you have a whole lot of room? From, from the sides of it. Okay? No. So that's why I say five feet. Okay? That's my philosophy is five feet. The book says 42 inches. If you want somebody to walk behind it, which is less than four feet, that's three foot six. To me, that's not enough room because that's when you're doing this kind of walk. Trying to get behind somebody. Okay? So you can see why just going by code a lot of times is really not the best route. Okay? So a nook, a nook's going to be the same way. Your nook's going to be smaller for the simple fact is generally you're not putting as big as a table in the nook. The tables in the nook are only generally the size of the household and it has to, that's not, or the, of the household. So if there's four people in a house, a nook should only contain a table that fits four people. Okay? So that's kind of how you got to figure. All right? Well, we have a nook and a bar in my house. So yours is a dining room, right? It's attached right next to the bar in the kitchen. Wow. So y'all don't have a dining room in your house? Okay. Yeah. That is a key. That is exactly what he said. If it does not have a dining room, a lot of times the couple will want you to fit in their nook basically a dining room table. Okay. So this is all the stuff you kind of got to know. That's the first thing. When I'm sitting down and I'm visiting with a client, that's why I'm going down the list. You want a dining room? No. So you want a nook? Yes. Okay, is the nook going to be big enough to fit your household or you want it big enough for family gatherings? Big enough for family gatherings. Okay, so now you're knowing the space you got to throw in there. So these are the kind of things you got to know. They're not as important as some of the other features of your house, but they still are things you need to know. Next thing is a den, a study, or office. Okay. Den, study, or office. All right. A den is a, you don't hear that name anymore. Okay, that's another name that was from the '60s, '70s, um, that kind of thing. That's right. Well, yeah, you don't. They still have them, but sunrooms aren't as popular as they used to be. But a den study or office doesn't have to be that big, yet again. When it was called a den, it was really just to separate your living area from your sleeping quarters. Okay? So they always kind of placed in that range. It was just something to separate the two parts of the house. Yet again, a den back in the 60s and 70s was a smaller gathering space other than the living room. Okay? And really your den, a lot of times, is actually where they would put the table. It wasn't really called a dining room back then. Okay? So, we don't call it that anymore. Okay? Now, generally, if we're going to have something that separates, it's generally an office or a study. Okay? Computer or just a, a kid's desk or something in there where they can do homework, um, that kind of thing. 
if you're going to have something like that, I don't think they actually give you a minimum in here. But my philosophy is no room in a house as far as an uh, office study should be smaller than 9 foot by 9 foot. Okay, no office should be smaller than 9 foot by 9 foot. Why? Why would I say 9 foot by 9 foot? Because how many turns and bedrooms do you need to? It's the worst case scenario because I don't believe a bedroom should be, I'll get to that in a minute, should be that small. But if, if, if something happened and it is a must, you can still turn that into some type of little bedroom. Okay. It could be like a nursery. It could be because a nine foot by nine foot, you can't not really get a closet in there and live comfortable. Okay. So that's why I say nine foot by nine foot in emergency cases, you can fit somebody in there. Okay. Another room that's becoming very big in a house is different than the family room, actually. It's called the man cave. Okay. Or specific term is actually called the home theater room. This is where they put the bigger TVs. A lot of people do the stadium style seating. Okay. Um, surround sounds, the Xbox, the PlayStation 3, um, mini bars, <laughs> maybe even a pool table. All this kind of stuff. Okay. This has now become one of the things on my checklist that I ask. Will there be a man cave or a home theater in your house? Okay. They are becoming the, the thing in today's time. Because of Call of Duty. Online. Gears of War. Online. So you get buddies come over and you play it all together online. The wife doesn't want to hear that crud. Okay. So that's when they'll have the family room and man and his friends can be in the other room and so forth. Okay. So this is another area. Yet again, the size of this area will all be dependent upon the furniture that's going to go in it. Because if you're going to do a pool table, oh man, you got to add all kind of extra room for a pool table. Yeah, that's a big. Okay. Uh, depending on the size, it's regulation. I think you got to add 10 foot at the end where you're going to um, break from, which is where you're going to initially start the game off. No, just concrete, regular concrete holes. Um, you have to have 10 foot on one end. I think you have to have five or six feet around the rest of the table just for a cue stick to be able to fit. All that kind of stuff. Okay, so you can see depending on what's going to go in the room as far as a man cave room theater, you have to know the sizes. All right. Let's talk about bedrooms. This is a very big thing for me. Of course, you have two types of bedrooms, right? What are they? You can have your traditional bedrooms, and then you can have your master bedroom or master suite. Master suite involves a master bathroom, also. Okay, so if you hear, if the person tells you they want a master suite, that will also include a bathroom in it. If they just want a master bedroom, that does not necessarily mean they want a bathroom in there. So you need to know that terminology. A lot of people still today build a master bedroom and share a bathroom with their kids. Okay. The big thing today is having master suites. That's the most common now. Most people, if they're in their bedroom, they want to be able to get dressed, take a shower, do everything they to, need to. Now, a thing that I saw that I now want to incorporate in my next house is I actually want to include the utility room in my master bedroom. 
in my closet. Yes. I seen one. I went into one. And let me tell you what. The convenience factor is awesome. Yes, you just wipe them up the counter from the clothes. You go to get in the shower, and you put your clothes into a dirt, uh, hamper. The hamper is right next to your washing machine. Okay. What they do now a lot, and I love the idea, they get the front loaders. They actually put a countertop over the top. Inside the countertop actually has, right toward the edge, they actually have holes cut out of it. So when you separate your clothes out, you just throw them down in one hole or the other. It's closed off in the front where you can't see it. Okay? Or some of them actually have it where it's a flat lid that has a finger hole, and when you go to throw your clothes in there, you just put your finger in it, lift the lid, throw it in there, and close the lid so it's not being seen. Because who generally does the laundry in your house? The parents, right? Okay. So generally, you're going to be doing the laundry. You want it right there to where when it comes out, straight out of the dryer, you can hang it up, put it in your closet right there. Bam. Right, okay. So it kind of does away with a utility room and gives you a extra space to do what you want with. So that's another thing that you got to be careful of when you design the house. But in a bedroom, okay, a traditional bedroom, the book I think tells you nine by nine by ten. Okay. Now, here's what the International Residential Building Code tells you is a minimum of 70 square feet. Okay, that's what the International Building Code says. It has to be at least a minimum of 70 square feet. If you think about that, that's not big at all. Okay. It says right here, uh, homes financed by Federal Housing Authority, which is the FHA. If you've never heard about the FHA, um, what it is, it's a federal loan, it's not, it's from a bank, but what it is, is the federal government is actually giving the money to the bank to loan to, or, or insuring it, let, let me say it that way, they're basically insuring the bank, saying, if they, what it is, what an FHA loan is, I'm going to tell you, because I'm in one now. If the mortgage you're trying to get, okay, generally a bank, if they're refinancing your house, they only give you 80% of what your house is appraised at, okay? So if your house is appraised at $207,000 or somewhere up in that range, or $200,000, then the bank's only going to give you 80% of that. Okay, so they're going to give you, what, 160000 If you need more than that to cover it, what, to do, what they do is they turn it into an FHA loan. The federal government is ensuring that if you give them this loan and you cannot finish paying the loan, then the federal government will step in and pay the difference of that. Now, the FHA only stays in effect until you get below the 80%. Okay? Once you get below 80%, the federal government steps out and says, now it's on you. Okay, it's covered. So that's what they're talking about, the FHA, the Federal House Housing Authority. They require bedrooms to be 100 square foot. Okay, that's, that's a good, decent size. Still, still, still small, though. Here is the way Mr. Ladner sees a bedroom. A bedroom should not be smaller than 12 by 12. Okay. A regular bedroom should not be smaller than 12 by 12. Believe it or not, if you're smaller than that, let's say, let's just say, for instance, you're a 12 by 10. And you get a queen size bed in there, 
You cannot fit anything on the side. No, you can't put anything on the side unless you get one of those little plastic totes. I had a 10 by 10. That's small that you can open. Okay. A queen size bed now. Yeah. Most most regular bedrooms for kids has twin or full size yeah, beds. Okay. So that's my general thing. You don't go lower than 12 by 12 in a bedroom. Okay. So the book says 100 square feet, which is generally 10 by 10, but 12 by 12 is the best way to go. All right, let's talk about the master suite, though. A master seat suite steps up. The minimum the book says is 12 foot by 14 foot. That's about the minimum. That, that probably is about as low as I would go. 13 by 16 is probably more of what I'd stop at. I think a master bedroom should be bigger, a lot bigger, because I feel like a master bedroom should have two different things in it. It should have enough room for a king size bed and two end tables, two end side tables, okay, two nightstands. It should put at least two dressers and an armoire, okay. And one other thing should be included in the master bedroom. You need to have enough room to be able to put a recliner or a little sleep whatever they call those things. You know one you can just sit on, read, and stretch out? Chase. Is that what's called chase? <laughs> okay, chase. a chase. Okay. So I like to do that. That's generally when I do a master suite. Why? Because your master's bedroom should still be like a little getaway for a parent. Okay. If, the, if you do only have a family room, the kids are in there watching a the movie, you don't really want to watch a movie, you really don't want to have to go strictly to your bedroom to get away for some peace and quiet and lay on the bed to watch, read a book. So that's why I generally like to design a master bedroom to have a, somewhere where you can sit. My master bedroom does have a king size bed, has all the furniture I told you, and I got a recliner. Oh, I put one of mine because I don't like a chase. I don't want to have to be sitting sprawled out all the time. So in mine, I put a recliner so that when I go in there, if, if kids and the wife's in the living room, or they're making too much noise and I want to watch a football game or something, I can go sit in the recliner, either sit up and watch it or kick back and watch it or whatever way I want to back and go to sleep. Oh, it's not that big in my bedroom. Because I don't spend a whole lot of time in there. So I don't I have a big I think I have a 32 inch in there. But nothing very big. Alright, um, so that's why your master suite is all going to be how you lay it out. Okay, so in a master bedroom, you have to be careful of window placements. Most people in here, if they want to design a house right now, how would you design your windows in the bedroom? Most likely you would just try to even them up, even spaces on the wall, right? Make sure the light's not coming in your eyes when you come. Master bedroom, your window should be closer to the intersecting wall. Why? King size bed. You want your king size bed to at least be able to fit in between the windows. Okay? You do not want your king size bed to fit up against a window sill. All right. So that's the tradition now. Is people do not want their beds butting up against the window. They want them spaced out. Matter of fact, I watch a, a well-known architect. If they have a single window in a the bedroom, they're no longer centered in the wall. They have them pushed one way or the other allow that a bed will never touch a window. Okay. So that's something you gotta be careful about. I did a half a million dollar house a couple years ago and that's how they wanted their house. They didn't want their any of their beds to touch. So most of their windows were about six to eight inches away from the wall. <coughs> wall. 
Okay. Um, a lot of people now in their master bedroom they'll put two windows like that and then they'll put like a transom window right in the middle that would be over their bed that allows the natural light to flow right up from above and down into their bed. So that's something you need to think of. Today everything is going from traditional. Okay, a lot of houses just don't have traditional windows. There's transoms here, transoms there, little bitty block windows here, little bitty block windows there. Master bathrooms. This is becoming the big in master bathrooms. Block windows. Not, some of them are glass. The ones that want to spend that much money. Um, you can actually go to like Lowe's or to a window company and order. It's block windows now. It's not glass but it's like a hardened polyurethane style glass block or whatever it's like a real hard plastic it's just a hard plastic it can open them anything it just allows traditional light to come through instead of always having like the basement like people put in the basement well the basement windows you can usually open at least get out but this is traditionally block windows are traditionally used in bathrooms for this reason, this reason alone. Natural light's coming in, but nobody can see in. Okay? That's the biggie. Go to hospitals. A lot of the waiting rooms actually have the block walls encompassing it, but you can't see through it. Okay? It's allowed traditional light to come in. Uh, I know my bathroom personally has one right over the garden tub, a big one. So that in the morning we necessarily do not have to have a light on, because you have all the light coming through. So that it also helps you save energy and save electricity. So that's the things you got to know in a master bedroom. Now, what about the master bath? Because this will go in a master suite. All right, master bathroom now a lot of times either has both closets in it. They have one closet in it. A master bathroom usually has um, a shower and some type of garden tub. What's a garden tub? It can be a jacuzzi where it has the jets, or it can be a jacuzzi without the jets. Okay. And it's just without the enclosure going up the wall that has a shower and all that. It's just a bigger tub. It's an oversized tub to allow for more relaxation. Does the bathroom have to have a window? Yes. Generally, you won't want to. And this is why. <clears throat> you think about if you don't have some type of vent or some type of window in a bathroom, and you never have any way for escaping of the moisture. The vents. Yeah, a lot of people have them in there for the toilet area. If you don't have one of those, because a lot of people don't put one in their bathroom. They don't like the noise. So if it doesn't have a vent, you're going to want some type of window for the moisture to be able to escape. Okay. Well, technically, if you put a block window up, you'd have to have a fan anyway, so you couldn't open the window. Yes. Yes. So there's a lot of things you got to look at. Um, you, yet again, you want the, uh, generally some type of light in your bathroom other than just, you know, uh, artificial. You do want some type of natural light in the bathroom. So, yes, I do advise all bathrooms to have windows. Yeah. <laughs> so I do advise all bathrooms have some type of natural light, either be through skylights, with a light up in the ceiling, or you know, a window up in the ceiling to let the light come through, or lock lock windows, or a regular natural window. You need to have some type of window in the bathroom. Another big thing, now I'll tell you this, this isn't common, but I did have a couple come up to me and I designed a house for them. They wanted a his and hers bathroom. 
Okay, his and hers bathroom is bigger than a natural master suite because has to have a his and hers sink, has to have a have a his and hers toilet, has to have a his and her closet, and the one I did for a couple wanted it so his and hers that the toilet area for the guy had a shower in it, the garden tub for the woman had a toilet in it. They were both completely closed off. So if she was taking a shower and needed to use the toilet, she's closed off. You can't see her, nobody can see her. Oh, yeah. There's some people that the, the, the toilet is just not something they want their spouse to see them on. Hey, I mean, you think about that. It is a pretty nasty situation, okay? That's a, that'd be a good his or her thing. I see that in the Both of them just have their house built, and they have, you know, their master suite, and they have their master bathroom, and they have their shower and their bathtub in there, and their closet and their utility area. But um, they have their toilet in the second little four by four room at the back, right yeah. after you leave. Yeah. See, in my house, actually, in my house, Hey, I'm not even sure if that'd be a new one. I was raised in a big family, so we're not shy whatsoever, I guess you'd say. Leave the door. <laughs> so in my house, I have a garden tub, straight across from the garden tub is a shower. And the only thing we have separated off in a closed in separate area is the toilet. So that if I'm taking a shower or she's taking a bath or whatever, and one of us is in the toilet, you shut the door and you're in the toilet. Yeah. Here's my thing. There's one thing I do not want to do. I don't want to smell somebody else. <laughs> and I have kids too, and my kids forget about their own bathroom that they have with their own clothes in toilets. And for some reason, I don't want to come run into my bathroom. So I have a I, I do clothes all, and I do my design is pretty. Uh, if you ever seen a house that I did. You'll see one consistent thing is that Master of Suite always has a closed off toilet. Okay. I do it in traditional houses that do not have a Master Suite, just a regular. I always close off a toilet. My kids' bathroom, I plan for unisex. Because I, you know, when I designed it, I had a girl already and was fixing that up. And we were going to have another one. I planned it in case it was a girl or boy. The tub. It's closed off, or you can do it. This has a door. The toilet is closed off, or it has a door, and it has two sinks. So they can both be in there at any time and be able to get a shower, use the bathroom, and get the sink off at the same time. So this is the kind of stuff you know you have to think about when you're designing a house. Let's talk about closets. Okay, closets. Man, there's all kinds of different closets, aren't there? Now here's what I think's funny, and this is this, and, and it's just true. Look at their minimum lengths of closet. For a male, they recommend 48 inch length. For a female, they recommend 17. Yeah, I've read that. In my life. Okay. <laughs> yes, and you think about that. It sounds funny, but when I design houses, I design the same way. A male's closet is generally maybe 75% or 50% the size of the female's closet. Okay. If you actually go to my house and look, my closet is 3 foot 10 deep and I think it's only uh, four foot long my wife's closet is five foot deep by eight foot long okay so a woman generally has coats and sweaters and shoes pound, mounds and mounds of shoes and purses and so they need the area to put all the stuff me I'm simple I got two pair of dress shoes two pair of tennis shoes or outside shoes and I'm good okay yeah. 
I told my wife, this is all I needed enough room for, was enough to put the few pair of shoes I had, the few pair of pants I had, the few pair of shirts I had, and my golf clubs. As long as my golf clubs sit in there, that's all the room I need. Yeah. So the kids don't get them to break everything in the house. Yeah, exactly. All right. The minimum depth. All right. The minimum depth of a club is 24 inches. That means when you open the door and you see the back of the closet, it needs to be 24 inches. That's a minimum. Okay. No, that's that's code minimum. My minimum. Okay, my minimum, what I usually do is three feet. Okay, why do I do a minimum? And this is only in bedrooms. This is only in a, in a bedroom, okay? The reason I do a minimum of three feet is because you can at least partially walk into the closet. Okay? You can at least partially walk into a closet that is three foot deep. So it gives you a little bit of room to maneuver. I hate more than anything to have a 24 inch closet and you open the door and you're trying to get something all the way in the back of it and you can't get in there and you're trying to move clothes to get to it. So if you do three feet, generally you can actually get in there and get down to the inch. Okay. Three foot deep is what I generally go. The length, okay, the length in the closet, I don't think they actually give you one in the book. No, they do not give you one. But the length in the closet, minimum, I'd say, is three foot. Okay? Three foot minimum of length. Personally, personally, I, I do minimum of uh, five foot. Five foot is really the minimum of the length. And the reason I do five foot minimums is for this reason alone. I put in double doors in all my closets. I don't have single door closets in my house. The reason being is if you have a double door that is almost the length of your closet, when you open up both doors, you can get into the entire closet, not just a little bitty space. Okay? That's the way I design. But that's just me. Now, actually, oh, the rule of thumb is generally you want some type of, okay, some type of closet near the bedroom. <laughs> that is eight, a minimum of 18 inches deep, by 24 inches wide. Why? Linen closet, vacuum. Some type of stuff like that to be able to go in. Okay. So 18 inches by 24 inches, 18 inches deep by 24 inches long, is a normal little closet you want near the bedroom. Okay. Is it considered a closet that goes under the stairs? Yes, that is a closet. Okay. <clears throat> now walk-in closets. For like master bedrooms and stuff, you don't really want them smaller than six foot by six foot. Okay? That's walk-in closets. I don't personally, for the males, do traditional walk-in closets. Okay? I only stick to that generally for the women's, for the females' closets. Because like mine, like I said, three foot by three foot ten by four foot is plenty big enough for my closet. Okay? Men just don't need all that room. Exactly. <clears throat> and a lot of things, I, a lot of times, um, when I design a house, I'll also include about a three foot deep or three foot ten, somewhere in there between three and three foot ten deep by four foot long hallway closet. You never have enough storage in a house, just remember that. Ever. Okay. 
You never have enough storage in a house. I literally know some a person I designed a house for that made me design a closet. But they could push their artificial Christmas tree into it every year. <laughs> My dad didn't build a house like that. It was actually in the dining room and it was like, I don't know, it was ridiculously high ceilings and the tree yep. was a height and it was on wheels and they just pushed it. Exactly what they do. There's a lot of people that buy the artificial trees and do not want to take them down and decorate them every year. So I'll design a closet strictly to push that tree in. It's actually not a bad idea. I'll tell you what, it's, that's, that's one of the most aggravating parts of Christmas is that put up Christmas tree. Like, if, especially if you want a real big Christmas tree, like something like 10, 12 yeah. feet tall, like a big open area. Yeah. I mean, those are the nice ones. Here's my thing. I'm okay putting the ornaments on it every year because that is kind of fun. Yeah. But the lights, <laughs> when you're digging up in the tree, trying to get it around the tree, and you're trying to, you got somebody on the other side, and you're trying to lasso it over to them. And, you know. Those trees hurt. Yeah, and they're very prickly. And, and if you have a, 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 my wife breaks out rash every year when we try to put up a Christmas tree because she's allergic to that stuff. So. No, oh man, those things are too messy. You ever seen one burn? Yeah, it goes like that. Yeah, that's one of the biggest, that is one of the biggest reasons my house burned down around Christmas time with real trees. Oh yeah, you paint. You, yeah. You gotta be careful. It's not safe to leave your lights on. Huh? You ever seen one burn? Yeah. I burned All right. You're burn me just as green as it can be. Blink and you miss it. You wouldn't want to eat nothing. You get so much soot on whatever you're trying to cook over a Christmas tree. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about uh, service areas. All right, one of your main service areas in a house is a bathroom. We've already talked about one type of bathroom, and that was what? Master. Master. Master bathroom is located where? Master bedroom. There you go. Next to the master bedroom. Let's talk about other bathrooms. Okay. There's two types of other bathrooms in a house. Okay. One of them is a three-piece bathroom. What is a three-piece bathroom? Sink, shower. Tub, shower, combination. Toilet. The sink. That's a three piece kind of uh, bathroom. The other one is considered a two piece or a half bath, where it's just a toilet and a sink. Okay? A half bath has to be a minimum of two foot ten inches wide. Has to be a minimum of two foot ten inches wide. Anybody know, wonder why it's two foot ten inches wide? From the center of your toilet, all right, and this, this will go for everything. So think about, this is goes from where the end of a cabinet gets, how close it gets to a toilet and everything, okay? And how close the toilet is to a bathtub. The general rule is, it has to be 17 inches from the center of the toilet to the wall. That's wide, okay? From the center of the toilet to the edge of the wall wide. 17 inches. That's each side. That's where 2 foot 10 comes in. 17 inches plus 17 inches is 34 inches. That is 2 foot 10. That would be placed in the center. That's basically placed in the center of that half bath against the wall. <laughs> okay? Okay, the general room, uh, rule for the wall sitting directly in front of a toilet, okay, the general rule for that, you only have to have a minimum of two foot from the front of the toilet to the wall. 
a minimum of two foot in the front of the toilet to the wall. Because that is should be plenty enough room for you to sit on the toilet and have enough room. Okay. That's minimals now. Now I do traditionally stay two foot ten on the whip. Okay? I do stick to two foot ten. That is plenty of room for you to sit in a closed in toilet area and have enough space. Two foot ten. Okay. Alright, two foot ten. Actually, if you go in there and measure that stalls in these bathrooms, two foot ten is probably bigger than this. Okay. Now, the length, okay, my length is a lot longer than what they say. Okay, because I think a toilet's about between 24 and 36 inches. It's probably more like 30 inches long. So two more feet would be four foot six. I close all my toilets off. So my minimum is like seven feet somewhere around there. Okay. Because generally I have a door in between the toilet and the sink. And I have that. Okay. Yeah. About seven feet. Because you think about it. You have a 30 inch toilet, and you put about a two foot six door in there, that's another 30 inches. That's 60 right there, that's five feet. And then you have enough room for a seat, which is another 44 inches. If you have a vanity, that's seven feet. So seven and a half feet is actually what I do most of my life, seven and a half. Okay. So you see where we're closing in something can start eating up space because yeah. it's still like a little that's why my houses that I design are a little bit bigger than a lot of houses because even though you don't spend a whole lot of time in a toilet area, when you're there, it's important to be comfortable. When you're there, I don't want to be like that. Hey, I say a little thing of camper for a couple yeah. months. I didn't say that. Whenever I leave, yeah. I had to prop my leg up on the exactly. bathtub. I lived in one after Katrina for a few months myself, but I'm going to tell you what, that's not something no, I want. They, they ain't no way they even meet the minimum. Okay. Now, a traditional three piece bathroom has to be five foot wide. Why five foot wide? That's no minimum, that's no maximum. It has to be five foot. A traditional standard shower toe combination is five feet long. And when I mean five foot, that means the tub goes in before the sheetrock goes in, and it is five foot. Because it slides in and you screw it to a stud. You don't even have sheetrock there yet. So your standard tub has to go in for sheetrock ever goes into the house. Okay. I've seen people put the sheetrock up and then put the tub in. <laughs> Guess what? That tub's not going in now. Alright. All your tubs have to, even your garden tubs, all that has to go in before sheetrock goes in. So, going back to that master bathroom, it is very important to have their garden tub size before you finish designing the house. Because believe it or not, you generally have to have some designated space for the garden tub. You have to know that size. Because garden tubs don't come in just traditional feet. Like mine, the one I bought, actually had an eighth of an inch to it. Could you imagine if trying to move a wall eighth of an inch over? Okay, that would kind of bite. So you have to know these sizes, or you'd have to start doing some shimming. Or if it's an eighth of an inch too short, you're, you're moving the wall. So you got to know this stuff, okay? So a regular bathroom has to be five foot. No if, ands, or buts into that. It has to be five foot. It can be longer. I mean, it can be wider. It can be six foot if you want it. But guess what you're going to be doing right behind that tub? 
You're going to be put in a chase. Okay, you're going to be put in a false wall just so your tub can go in. All right. So five foot is the standard bathroom. Have you ever noticed that? I bet you none of you ever noticed that every time you walk into a house, a regular bathroom is the exact same size. Just about every time. Okay. But the length of it is all dependent on how many sinks they're going to have in there. Because same thing, the toilet, most of the toilets in a standard bathroom sits right next to the tub, right? It still has to be 17 inches from the center over to the tub. It has to be 17 inches from the center over to the cabinet. Okay? So you have to plan for that. And then depending on what size sink you have will depend on the rest of the bathroom. If you only got a 36-inch sink, then that's all the other room you need. You have a standard shower tub, or is it bigger? No, it is not regular one, but you have the double or whatever, and then you have like a two wall in there. Okay. I would say it's one in the length. So yours is like real. Your bathroom is real long. It's long. Yeah. Okay, you can go that route too, but most people. Five feet this way, and then you stack your toilet sink coming this way, and that's how long it is. Because you think about it, if you do a shower five foot, either way, it's going to be five foot one way or the other. Okay? So that's what you got to think about when you design a bathroom. Um, bathroom locations, of course, one bathroom should always be where? Right there, either button up to one or the other kid's be bedroom or one of the other bedrooms. Okay, you shouldn't have to go too far to get to a bathroom. Another bathroom, a lot of times, is near the kitchen <coughs> or a half bath or near the living room or inside the utility room. Okay. I know a lot of people now where their utility, hey, you walk to the, through the utility room and go into the kitchen a lot of times, or you walk from your garage going into your kitchen, a lot of people put a bathroom right there so if the kids are outside playing, they don't have to come all the way through the house. A bathroom is right there by the back door. Yep. So actually my house has a half bath in the kitchen. So right by the utility room, so that if we have a big gathering, our gathering basically stays, if it's like an outside thing where we're doing stuff, the gathering don't go any farther than the kitchen. Yeah. Outside grilling, got to use the bathroom, right. open the door. So that's kind of how we did ours. Kitchen. Let's talk about the kitchen. Big Kitchens don't have a specific size, but it, do, it does have a minimum. If, if the width of a kitchen has to be a minimum of seven feet wide. Why seven foot? Same measured out deal like with the bathroom. And let me rephrase that. It has to be seven foot if you got cabinets on each side. Okay. If you only have cabinets on one wall, it has to be a minimum of five feet. Why? Because your base cabinet is 24 inches with your countertop. Okay. And then you have to have, you have to have three foot walking area. Okay. So from the edge of your countertop to the wall has to be three foot. That is a minimum code requirement. Why? Can anybody tell me why? Fire hazards. Everybody heard of ADA? Handicap accessible. A wheelchair person has to be able to get around all areas in your house. 
All main areas. That does not include bedrooms. Okay? But all kitchen areas, family room areas, all that has to have at least a three foot entrance. Minimum. Because a person in a wheelchair has to be able to get through it. That is exactly why all exterior doors have to be three foot. Now, I had to design a house for a couple. The entire house had to be ADA compliant. Which means you had to have one ramp somewhere into the house. Which means all <laughs> doorways, all doorways had to be three foot. In the entire house. Okay? So you have to know these kind of things. If it's ADA, everything has to be three foot. Even if the house isn't ADA, all passageways has to be three foot as far as like around the kitchen, um, through into your living room, into a dining room, um, into a not necessarily a utility room that has to be, but your main rooms like your kitchen, your foyers, your uh, Family rooms, all that kind of stuff. Bedrooms don't have to be. Because if they're a guest, they're not should be in your bedroom anyway. Okay? So, strictly your main rooms have to be three foot compliant. So a kitchen has to be. Not only that, but if you're in a kitchen and you're opening an oven, you need three foot to be able to use it. Okay. Now, in a kitchen, there's one main thing that you have to... Think about when you're working it. It's called the work triangle. Okay? We talked about a kitchen earlier. Depending on who you're designing it for, if it's kosher, it's going to have to be one way. If it's a traditional family, it's going to have to be one way. Even traditional families, some people want double ovens, one range somewhere. Um, they may have one main sink. They have may have one in the center of their island with a prep as a prep sink. Um, they may have an island. They may not. They may have a bar. They may not. All this kind of stuff goes in the kitchen. Okay. If you have a range, the range is basically the top stove top. It has to be able to be vented. Which means you have to have a hood or a vent of some type above it. That is why most ranges are on the wall. Because then the hood goes against the wall and vents up through your roof. Today, there's a lot of microwaves being made that is actually served as a vent. For instance, my house has a normal oven stove combination or a range stove combination. Oven stove. And then it has a microwave above it that has a vent built into it. It has a filter on it. And as it sucks up, it filters all the stuff into it, I guess. Okay. So you can have that type of situation. That way you don't have this big hood vent that's real loud in your kitchen. But if you do not have that above it, you do have to have a hood, and the hood has to be, have a light switch to it. To turn it on and off. Okay? But the work triangle, here's the three things that the work triangle goes over. Alright, the work triangle covers. Let's see, uh, let me make sure I tell you this right. The work triangle consists of the refrigerator, the sink, and the range, the stove top. Not necessarily the oven part, but the range top, the one you cook on. Because you usually go from sink to range top, or refrigerator to sink to range top. The, they basically say the best design of a kitchen has to form a triangle. If you draw a line from all three to the other, it has to be a triangle. 
You cannot be in a straight line, which means you don't want your refrigerator, your sink, and your range top all on the same wall. That is not good practice. Okay? They say it needs to be in a triangle pattern. Now, if you want to know what that means, Oh, here's a good thing at the bottom of page 195. No side of the word triangle, triangle should be less than 4 foot or greater than 7 foot. Which means if you go to walk from one of those three appliances, if you go to walk from one to the other, it should be no closer than 4 foot, but no greater than 7 foot to get from one to the other. That is good practice. The reason being, if you get any less than four foot, you can't fit proper cabinets in there. If you get greater than seven foot, then that's just a long way to have to walk to get from one to the other. Okay? I think basically the rule of thumb is it's something like... Uh, you should not have to take no more than three natural steps to get from one to the other. Okay. All you surveying people, you know, remember your steps the other day? The average step was what? Probably 2.35 feet, somewhere around there. Some may be a little greater, some may be a little less. 2.4, 2. So think about three steps at 2.3 feet. What is that? Seven feet. Two point three plus two point three is what? Four point six plus two point three is two point uh, six point nine. So it's right at seven foot. Three natural steps is all it should take for you to get from one to the other. Oh, um, page one ninety six shows you the different types of kitchens. You see the ones, the straight one wall, that's not the best practice, but there are some apartments and stuff that you can't get away from doing. Okay? There's some apartment, how many of you watch HGTV and watch all these, where they go, the foreign house hunters and all this, or foreign, I think it's house hunters, international house hunters? House hunters. What we pay for huge places here, and they go over there and get one little one bedroom where the the bedroom, the living room, the kitchen is all in space. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes those are straight line. You can't do anything about it. Okay. Oh, I saw one where an architect did. I loved it. The space was no bigger from the wall to that column. His bedroom, his kitchen, and his living room were all there. But when he wanted one or the other, his bed folded up into a wall. His kitchen and his living room, he had a wall that when he hit a button, it came out and separated. It was it was pretty, it was, it was awesome. So depending on what scenario, a different wall came out and stuff and, and made it different things. So you need to learn these uh, different types on page 196. Different types of layouts for kitchens. The upper cabinet in a kitchen is 12 inches. The upper, 12 inches deep. The lower, 24. Okay? So when they're shown on your floor plan, you will see both. The lower cabinet, 24 inches out from the wall, will be a solid line. The upper cabinet, 12 inches off the wall, will be a hidden line. That's how you will represent it on a floor plan. 24 and 12. Hidden line for the upper, which is 12 inches. Solid line for the lower, which is 24. Okay, and I will go ahead and tell you back to the closets. Um, real quick, I don't know if they actually told you in the book or not.
they don't really tell you. But generally, even in the closets, you want to show a solid line for a um, shelving. If you're going to put some type of shelving there, you want a solid line. And then you'll represent the, the rod for your clothes hanger, or for the rod for the clothes. You'll represent that as a hidden line. That will be 12 inches. The rod's 12 inches off the wall. The shelf will be however much you want. Traditionally, it's like 14 inches. Okay? The rod's 12. The, the shelving's 14. One more thing about a kitchen. Um... For one, like I told you before, you need to know the sizes of appliances. They want that huge refrigerator, you gotta have a spot for it. They want double ovens, you gotta have spots for it, all that. Pantries. Depending on what they want as a pantry, sometimes it's just cabinets that they use as their pantry, a big cabinets on the wall. Sometimes they actually want a butler's pantry where you walk in and it's big old nice show, um, closed in shelving and all this on each wall. Generally, that's either a separate room through a kitchen or it's actually like a foyer. It's a walk-in to the kitchen. Okay? Or a pantry is like a closet in a kitchen. You just make it whatever size you want. A lot of people want a pantry big so they can put like another freezer in it. Got a little refrigerator in it. Of course, put your cereal boxes, blah, 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 like that. So pantries... I can't give you a minimal or a maximum on that because it's whatever, whatever you can get in there. It can be as big or as small as they need it. You don't want to go any smaller, I guess I'd say, than 18 inches deep and 24 inches wide. 18 inches deep by 24 inches wide is as small a pantry as you want to get. Yeah, it's just like a linen closet. 18 by 24 is as small as you want to go if you're going to do it. Utility room. Your utility room has to be designed around the what? Washer dryer. Okay, washer and dryer. Depending on the size of that, depends on how big your room is. A lot of utility rooms now, if you're going to have a tank hot water heater, this is where it's located. Okay, the hot water heater has to be 18 inches each way from the wall. Or from any other appliance. Okay, 18 inches is generally what they say. 18, 15, 18 inches. From the center? 18 inches to the center. From the center to the wall. 18 to 15 inches from the center of the tank, water tank to a wall. Most people today are going tankless. Hot water heaters, which can go in your attic, can go on your outside wall, can go anywhere. What's that? Yeah, a tankless can. Mine in my house is in my attic. Yep. How much is that versus the hot water heater? Uh, tankless is twenty-five hundred. You can probably get a hot water heater or a tank for five. But the difference is, the tank constantly runs. Your pilot lit, your pilot light is lit, so you're constantly burning energy. And your hot water runs out when the tank goes dry. Tankless, hot water never runs out. It's electric or gas. You get the gas. Okay. Electric. I have gas. But it's still, here's, here's the funny thing that. It's still electric no matter what because you still have to plug it up to make certain elements work. But the gas is what heats it. Okay? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. So, and here, here's what a lot of people have the misunderstanding about when it comes to a tankless hot water heater. It is not instant hot water. You're not going to turn the hot water, hot water on and bam, the hot water's there. It's just like a tank. It's going to take a minute for the hot water to get to it. But once it gets there, on a tankless, it never runs out. Unless you run out of propane or natural gas, then, then you'll run out. Okay. 
Um, like I said before, utility room now, a lot of people are putting little showers in it. It's becoming a mud room, little showers, maybe a toilet. Um, a lot of people put a big uh, folding area where they got some cabinet space, countertop, to be able to fold their stuff, iron it as they need be, do all that. But if you're going to close off a um, washer and dryer, if you're going to actually close one off to make it where it's hid, it has to be three foot six deep. It has to be three foot six deep if you're going to have a utility closet. Three foot six deep by six foot long. Three foot six deep by six foot long. If you're going to have a utility closet, why? This is big enough to fit the washer and dryer. The natural the depth of a washer dryer is 30 inches. Okay? A dryer has to have a bin on the back of it, so you've got to have room for that to fit. Uh, washer machine has plugs that go into the wall for the water. You've got to have room for all that to connect. So that's why it's 30, uh, 3 foot 6, which is 42 inches. You've got to have that space. And the reason it's six foot long when you're closing it off is because each one of them are 30 inches, which makes it what? Five foot? So you need that extra 12 inches for gap, space between the wall, and space in between the two. Exactly. <laughs> Not only that, but you think about it, you can't get the washer and dryer out if you don't. Yeah. All right, that's why if you're going to do that, you got to have about you got to have a five foot double door. If you're going to do a utility closet, you got to have a five foot double door or a five foot accordion door, whatever you want to call them, the bifolds, because you still got to be able to get them out. So that's that's minimums. I mean, that it has to be. Mm. The rest of it, you just you just have to kind of go with what they want. Let's talk about one more thing, and I think we'll end this lecture today. I think we've just about covered everything. The last thing is a garage or carport. Okay, a garage or carport. Here's the one thing you got to know about a garage. It's got to step down three and a half lower than your main slab. A garage has to step down three and a half inches lower than your main slab. Minimum. Why? Water. When your garage door opens, and it's raining, and it's blowing in sideways, and it blows in, you have to have a way for the water to stop. So you basically got to have a curb inside your garage. So, and that curb is three and a half inches. All right. So let's think about that. So if you got a sl your slab step down three and a half inches in your garage, what is the header height? of your garage door. Your header height for a garage door becomes seven feet. <coughs> Why? Your normal header height is what? Six eight. Six eight from the main slab. Your garage step down three and a half inches. What's six eight plus three and a half? Not seven. Six foot eleven and a half because of material. But they make it seven foot because you don't see a difference between half an inch. Okay. So your header height is seven foot on a garage door. That's a garage door. That's like the fold up door, yeah. not not your regular traditional old single little open door, entry door. That is a garage door. Okay. Your your single old little entry door will still be six eight because they don't you know what I'm saying? 
but your garage door will be seven feet. You can get them with a header height of seven foot if you order them from a manufacturer. Now, what's the same, what's the normal or minimal size of a single car garage? Is eleven foot by twenty. Eleven foot by twenty. You can tell that code is old because you can't hardly find a vehicle today that fits in there unless you go get one of the little Fiats or uh, Mini Coopers or. I'll go ahead and tell you this. If you drive a extended cab, not even a crew cab, an extended cab truck, front bumper, the tailgate down, is about 21 feet. So will that fit in a single car garage? So what I'm trying to tell you is when you're designing a garage, you're not designing it to the minimum. The way I design mine, is by the longest vehicle that I know, which is 21 feet, normal extended cab truck, and I give three foot or more to be able to walk around. Because generally your tailgate's not down for one. And that gives you another two foot. So I figure three foot. So to me, for me, the length of a garage needs to be 24 feet from sheetrock to sheetrock. Okay? So 24 feet from she rides, she rides with the, the minimum of the, the drive-in part is. Okay, the width can be whatever you need it to be. The drive-in part really needs to be 24 feet. That's what I recommend to anybody. And you can even go bigger than that if you add a storage and all that into the garage. Double car, they say that's 21 by 21. Yet again, I go bigger. I say on a two-car garage, the minimum needs to be 24 by 24. Believe it or not, a 24 by 24 with two cars in it, you still can't open both doors all the way. Okay? So, now, if you're going to do, if you got a big jacked-up truck, you can still build a garage because they got garage doors that's specially made height wise and you would just have to jack up the ceiling height of the garage that you can get them in okay but you do you have to know I always ask that what kind of cars do you drive if it's a truck I know right off the bat I'm going 24 feet deep okay so that's what I recommend for all of you when it comes to the garage, most people's going, you don't find many single car garage anymore. Just aren't going to happen. So if you're going double car, 24 by 24 minimum. All right, and the, the garage doors, um, garage door, eight foot wide by seven foot high is your standard single door. Um, and it says right here, a door nine foot wide is the smallest that be, should be used for a truck. Then you have the double doors. That is typically, which they call a double door, that's a 16 foot wide double door that raises up. So that's the kind of door. Now you can get them in various sizes. If you go look on their manufacturer's website, you can get them in all kinds of different sizes. I will tell you this too. If you design a garage where it's going to have one big old 16 foot long door, when you draw it on your floor plan, you will have to specify a beam to go over that door. If it's laminated beam, steel beam, whatever you're going to put over there, it's going to have to have some type of beam to carry the weight. And you're going to have to label that on your floor plan. Okay? If you have to, call the beam manufacturer, say, this is my length. What size do I need? Okay? But you will have to put a laminated beam. And I will tell you, I got plenty of them in my house. They're not right. Okay? It took uh, over six of us to get in. 20 foot beam 
up into an 11 foot wall. That's climbing ladders, six of them, three on each end. Three grown men on each end. They are heavy. Okay? Yeah. All right. And the only other thing I want to talk to you, okay, for right now is um, what else should be on a floor plan? Dimensions. Okay. All right, you know what? No, let's just stop there. We've talked about what all, how big everything has to be in the house, right? Next week, we'll come in, because I'm going to go ahead and assign this to you. Next week, I'll finish up everything else that has to be on the floor plan. Okay? Because there is more information that you're going to have to include. Um, for instance, like trying to figure out the square footage of a house. What do you do to figure it out? All that kind of stuff. Okay? Huh? When the door is scheduled, we got to go over that. Stuff like that. Any questions about what we went over today? 24 living, 4,000 total. That's my deck, my fortress, car, four, that kind of stuff. I got a deck in the back that's seven foot, all the way across the length of the back, plus one portion of it, 16 foot wide. So above ground. The deck steps down to an above ground. It's got railing all around it. I don't think we all gonna fit in my little 16 foot round pool, whatever it's called. We got one big enough for the kids. The, the big one's coming here soon. Kids are getting too big for it. Yeah, yeah we got the big 27 or 30 footer coming in. My wife's been pricing. She wants one, but they devalue your house. Really? Yes, an in ground pool devalues the uh, value of the house. You want that? Ask them. Ask them. Ask them if the in ground pool has value. Ask a realtor. No, because if somebody wants to move into this house that does not want a pool, they deduct it from the price of the house because they do not want the pool to be there. Ask, ask, ask a realtor. In real hot places where you can't just go down to the beach, you don't bring them all up. All right, any questions? It'll be a YouTube video. You're going to build your ground up. No, I have one of those like aluminum, vinyl, above the ground. Yeah, I have one of those like aluminum, vinyl, above the ground. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go ahead. Um, any questions? What we covered? Anything that you didn't understand? Well, this is the biggest lecture. This, I mean, floor plan is so much in the design. You see, you can't just lay out a minimal size room. You got to know all kind of information about it. All right, I will put this video. I will give you a link out on Canvas. It's going to go to YouTube because this video will not go up to Canvas.